to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. In today's episode, we are going to revisit some stuff that we've talked about previously, both recently, but also far in the past. Right, Reed? Yeah. Yeah. We went over these pretty in depth, but we had a little bit different lens, right? When we were examining the idea of AFI 1-2, Commander's Responsibilities, we were looking at it in the lens of what does this mean for the average officer and what our responsibilities are. Yeah. And the reason for that is that just a few months before we started doing this podcast, the chief of staff at the time, General Goldfein, released a memo to wing commanders describing what it was that the Air Force values in its officers. And we took the opportunity to explore what those things were, what it is that the Air Force values. And that turned into a series of episodes where we explored each one of those things individually. But like you said, and what that memo was, was specific to the officer, not about commanders at all. But Mm -hmm. the stuff that was described there very clearly was pulled straight out of AFI 1-TAC-2 commander's responsibilities. And so in today's episode, where we want to have a discussion around what commanders actually do, it's going to have to come from that AFI. But the other thing, Reed, obviously we're going to get into that AFI, but if you really want to know what a commander does, go open any AFI, yeah, any manual, any handbook, any of the Air Force policies, and just look at the first paragraph or two, and it will tell you, it says there, commander responsibilities. Yeah. It's pretty all-encompassing when you think about it. Because there's just a few AFIs and instructions and manuals, just a few. <laughs> well, there are fewer now than there were. Yeah, but there's still a lot. And yes, it is interesting that one tac two is the only like explicitly, clearly defined, you know, AFI that's just for commanders' responsibilities. But yeah, there's plenty of guidance and instruction on what you're supposed to actually do. Yeah, no shortage of things that commanders are responsible for, but. In this episode, as pedantic as we often are, we are not going to open up every single AFI and read from it. That would be thrilling for sure, but nobody's going to listen to that. And certainly we don't have the time for it. And I just don't want to call him. <laughs> <laughs> it's just who are we getting, right? Um, and honestly, there's enough. In one tack two, there is enough yeah. to go into. And that's where we're going to start. So, you know, as you go through and you start to read it, One of the first things it states, and I'm just going to quote straight from that document. It says that commander has lawful authority and responsibility to promote and safeguard the morale, physical well-being, and the general welfare of persons under their command. So, Colin, you've actually talked about this idea before when you talked about what is an officer to you. You talked about this idea of like a father figure or mother figure. Mm -hmm. When I read this, I feel like this is kind of my job as a dad. And it made me think about your perspective on that. So what are your thoughts on this like general statement? Because we're going to get in and break it down and talk about some of these things individually because there are some interesting components to it. But what's like your general thought about that responsibility? Yeah, obviously we have people in our audience that are not parents. And so they don't have direct experience with being the lawful authority in the home and responsible for another human being's welfare and well-being but everybody has a parent right we've all seen that in action and is this not exactly what parents do and maybe you don't have 
actual parents, maybe you have guardians, maybe your family structure is a little bit different, but the principle remains the same that a parent or a guardian, or it could even be for pets, you know, you have this responsibility to make sure that this other creature, this other life form has everything that they need in order to thrive and survive, right? That they have Laszlo's hierarchy of needs, that they have their basic needs met of food, shelter, water, all of those things, but then moving up the hierarchy of making sure that they have purpose and safety and connection with other people. And that is what a parent does. And that's exactly what a commander does. And we're going to get into this pretty deep here about all the things that a commander must do to make sure that the people under their command have food, shelter, connection, safety, purpose. It's no different. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue to start breaking down some of the first aspects. So it says lawful authority and responsibility. So these aren't just like good ideas or best practices. Yeah. These responsibilities wield the force of law. This is not an asking authority. This is not even a telling. This is up to and include compelled by force. Mm -hmm. If necessary, there are legal backing to allow commanders to do what they do. And we've talked about this before a couple of times. I don't know how often brand new bushy eyed lieutenants get this idea when they, you know, pin on and get ready to jump into the air force. Yeah. Like it's legal power and authority. I don't know. To me, that really means something. It feels very real. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this idea of like the legal aspect, the physical power of law? that is imbued in a commander? Well, it gets into like the different types of authority that a person can wield, that you can influence somebody to do something because you're a good person and they respect you, or you have positional authority. You know, the rank on your chest matters when conversing with a junior member of the Air Force but those things are not necessarily demonstrative of the actual legal authority where by statute, by Title 10 U.S. Code, by written down documentation that says you have this authority, this ability to compel, much like a police officer, you know, a law enforcement officer mm -hmm. has the ability to compel people. That is the exact same thing that is available to a commander by virtue of their position as the commander. Yeah, an example the Air Force is experiencing right now could be instructive. So the President of the United States has required that all members of the United States Armed Forces get the COVID-19 vaccine. Right. You and I are not going to comment on the rightness or wrongness of this requirement. We're going to comment on what that means relative to the legal responsibility of a commander. Mm -hmm. So the Secretary of Defense requested permission of the president to make this a requirement. The president said, yes, this can be a requirement. And then the Secretary of Defense pushed out orders. Then the separate departments within the Department of Defense, right? So the Department of the Air Force issued guidance. Yep. And that trickled down the chains of command into, at least at our installation, the Special Court Martial Convening Authority, which is the base commander. Yeah. So I'm in a, like a tenant unit, right, of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I have a wing commander, but he does not have special court martial convening authority that lies with the installation commander. That commander issued guidance that was directly in line with the Secretary of Defense and the President's guidance. If you are an airman who does not want to get this vaccine, that will come with repercussions. Now, I don't know what those are going to be yet, but I have seen actual physical paper orders requiring individuals by name, you will, on this date, go to the medical center and you will get this shot. And then you will report back and I will check with the medical group that you've done this. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk hypothetically. I have no idea what's going to come of those who have decided not to get this, not to obey this order. But 
it would not surprise me at all if the special court martial board convenes and they are dismissed from the Air Force. Yep. Immediately and summarily unemployed. Yep. Think about that. Yeah. Your career, your life's work, your job gone in maybe a matter of days. I'm not sure. Right. Again, I'm not mm -hmm. speaking to how this could play out. That's what we're talking about here. The squadron commander handed out these orders that came from the airbase wing. They were addressed by name. You will, and these members will, or they're going to be dismissed, perhaps, right? Yeah. That's power. And it's required in order for the Air Force mission to be fully carried out and people's lives be uh, protected and we accomplish what it is that we as an Air Force are meant to do. That lawful authority of the commander is what enables all of that. Yeah. Now, it's not very often that that kind of thing happens. Generally speaking, we hope that commanders are able to rely on other forms of authority, that they are respected, that they are competent, that people believe and trust in what the commander stands for and is capable of doing. But as you have now explained, Reed, and this is a perfect example that sometimes the lawful authority is exactly what is needed to accomplish the Air Force mission. Interesting stuff. We could go on this forever. And if I got this wrong, any JAs out there, I'm listening. Come let me know. <laughs> you know, this was all hypothetical to some degree, but absolutely real in others. So, Colin, the next thing I thought was interesting is the words promote and safeguard. And I think it's interesting that they're together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I think of promote, I think of building, I think of creation, I think of fomenting, of like starting and making sure it continues to grow. Yeah. And when I think of safeguard, I think of shield or protect or maintain. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting that those two things were paired together. They're not the same, but they're related. You have to make sure it's growing and going and working, but you also have to protect it from outside things. Yeah. It makes me think of like investments, you know, how you want your investments to grow by, you know, compound interest or lending and building something, you know, from the capital that you already have or recreating something, improving something. But at the same time, as that grows, you don't want to have it taken away. You don't want it to diminish. So you have to protect it, safeguard it at the same time. So balancing of investments, you know, cash versus bonds versus those kinds of things. That's what it makes me think of. Yeah. Yeah. And the things that you're promoting and safeguarding, first one is morale. Colin, we haven't talked a whole lot about morale. And I think that's to the detriment of, you know, what we're trying to do here. Do we need to? Doesn't everybody know what morale is? I don't think they do. I think <laughs> we have a very one-sided view of what morale is. I think yeah. when people think morale, they think car washes and trunk or treats and like fun, get out of the office. Holiday parties. Not do work things. Yeah. Because there's a morale club and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But morale is a lot bigger than that. And I want to start off this section talking about morale and the relationship between promoting and safeguarding morale for their folks with a story from my deployment. This is your surprise face. You know, Reed Gans talking about his deployment again when he talks about major life experiences. <laughs> Wait, which deployment? Is this the one to Qatar or to the UK? Qatar, actually. Yeah. So is that the one where you were in charge of building the plan for aircraft to go into Syria? Yeah. But this was actually <laughs> on the way there when this okay. experience happened. So super interesting. If anybody's taken, you know, a military only flight to theater, you may have had similar experiences, right? So mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of airmen, maybe some soldier, sailors, and Marines with you. I don't know, but there's a chartered flight. Mine was Atlas Air. Yep. It was a 747, big, beautiful aircraft. I love the Boeing 747. Anyway, and it's not exactly the happiest thing I've ever seen. It's a pretty somber experience. Everybody on this aircraft is leaving friends and family, leaving home yep. to go to the armpit of the planet and <laughs> fight our nation's wars. 
You know, like it's not exactly a happy thing. Right. There are even reunions. You're like, oh, I haven't seen you in 10 years, you know, but it just in general, the mood is pretty somber. And depending on, you know, the number of personnel and how things are organized, you may have different boarding requirements. Most often the most junior of the personnel are responsible for like loading the aircraft, all the luggage. So like yeah. they'll literally say like any A1Cs on this aircraft, you see a couple hands go up and they're like, all right, go outside. You're loading the bags, you know, like you got to pay your dues. And then it's okay. Any commanding officers raise your hand and they, they get escorted up to first class. And then, you know, like mm -hmm. there's just the whole sorting based on, you know, our class as demonstrated by our rank. Anyway, the whole thing overwhelmingly was pretty sobering, right? Not a whole lot of chatter, just kind of a bunch of, just a bunch of negative Nancy's, all of us. We were just kind of down. Well, they get, it, it's almost comical. You get on and they do the whole like, you know, if you've not been in a car since the 1950s, they teach you how to buckle your seatbelt. You know, yeah. like they go through the whole <laughs> thing and it's just audio. And again, we're all like, yeah, we've all done this before. We know what's going on here. Well, this one like technical sergeant, he was deploying out to the same unit I was going to. He started like mimicking or mocking like the narrator yeah. in a comical and professional and funny way. And he just like broke the ice of the whole experience and just kind of elevated the mood. Mm -hmm. Like you could feel the, yeah. the cloud lift. Yeah, the, absolutely. The sunlight comes out. Yeah. And you realize, I mean, it was a wave of emotions, right? Like, okay, hundreds of thousands of people have done this before me and I'm going to be able to do it just fine. You know, we're all in this boat together. I can either, you know, wallow in my misery or I can see the silver lining through the clouds. And this one E6 in about 45 seconds completely changed the tenor of this experience. And I remember I pulled out my little notebook journal thing that I had at the time and I wrote down how tenuous and how important morale is. Mm -hmm. And and I was like, man, that guy, he made a difference. Yeah. And so a couple take-homes, right? That is our responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility, right? To influence the culture, the feeling, the spirit of where you are. Mm -hmm. But the buck stops with the commander. Yeah. And I just thought that was super interesting, that morale, promoting and safeguarding morale is a commander's responsibility. Well, can I say something about that real quick? So if we go back to paragraph one of AFI 1 Tech 2, scope of applicability, it says there it's specifically for commissioned officers holding command positions. However, later in that paragraph, it says that these principles should be applied by leaders at all levels. And so we see a perfect example there of this E6, this tech sergeant being a leader, safeguarding, protecting, promoting the morale of, it wasn't even a unit, but a group of service members and so he was absolutely within his responsibility, his authority there to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To keep going with morale, because I think this idea, again, what does this look like daily? We'll talk about it in a second. But so according to Oxford Dictionary, morale is the confidence, enthusiasm, and discipline of a person or group at a particular time. And I think that's super interesting. We've already explored the idea of discipline before, back in episode 42, yeah, where we talked about, you know, giving up your rights for the rights of others. And just a super quick review of what we explored with respect to discipline there. It includes a lot of things. It's both a noun and a verb. A discipline can be a field of study, mm -hmm. right? So if you are a botanist and study plants, that's your discipline. Also includes the idea of punishment. You are being disciplined for failing to obey or, or whatever. But more importantly to what we're talking about, it includes a dedication, a seriousness, and adherence to some sort of practice that yields a performance benefit. Yeah. And so when we think about morale, I think the easy button for most of us is, oh, make sure everyone's feeling good. Make sure everyone's happy to be at work. But there's a whole lot more to it. It includes a strict adherence to the principles of the group that will result in a performance benefit. And I think that's a much more nuanced definition of what morale is. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting to me about this definition from Oxford is that it says that it's the confidence, enthusiasm, discipline of a person or group. And I never think of morale 
of an individual. I always think of morale of a group. And is that not really how it plays out in the Air Force, that commanders are always concerned about the morale, the welfare of the group? Yes, that plays out by taking care of the individual, most often the individual who is pulling the morale down. But what are your thoughts there, Reed? Is the morale we're concerned about of the individual or of the unit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? Like, I do. You never think of morale being an individual thing. Yeah, until there is one person who's changing it for the group. And so, yeah, I do think it's both. I think one is a component of the other in both circumstances. If you are a super happy, ready to go, just, you know, feeling good about everything, and you walk into a dumpster fire of a unit, your individual morale is going to go down. Your adherence to discipline, all those things that we've talked about. And so in that way, the unit is impacting the individual. The organization is impacting the individual. And just like I described in my story, that one individual raised and changed the morale of an organization. Yeah. They both play off each other, and I think you have to manage and are responsible for both. That therein is the responsibility of the commander, yeah. is to pay attention to both. Yeah, exactly. It makes sense. It's just when I think of morale, I very rarely think of the individual, but yeah, I can see why you would say that it requires both. Yeah. So what does this look like day to day? So there is a morale club, and that is the responsibility of the commander. It is a commander program. This is often a series of NCOs or junior airmen who are in charge of you know, fundraising activities, of hosting events to you know, lift the spirits and you know, maybe get out of the office. Uh, I mean, chili cook-offs baking contests, I mean, calling car washes, holiday parties. I mean, the list goes on of kind of things that morale clubs have hosted. What are some things that come to mind when you think of the morale club? <laughs> I'm laughing because the one that I've seen most recently was a jousting tournament. Oh man, that sounds like a huge no for me. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the, <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the risk decisions the commanders had to go through to approve that, but whatever. Yeah. So just in general, right. The idea is to try to create an atmosphere where people want to be. Mm -hmm. And so some of these things are done in order to make that happen. There's other things too. So DOX, there are surveys that happen to, you know, what is the command climate? You know, take the temperature of the unit. That's a more official, formal way that that is done. But these are all things that commanders are doing regularly to get the pulse of the morale of the organization. That includes walk-arounds. Yeah. You know, making the rounds. You mentioned that earlier. Sometimes a commander, and they will have to program time into their day to do this. They will literally just get up and walk around and just talk to people. See, bump into them in the hallway. You know, walk through. It's amazing what you can learn just walking right through the workspaces of some of your folks. Yep. Yeah. We'll get into this later. But the commander has people that are responsible for keeping the pulse of the organization, especially like the first sergeant. That's what that position is for. But this responsibility of protecting, promoting, safeguarding the morale, 100% lies on the shoulders of the commander. And if they aren't out in the unit, getting a feel for how people are feeling, how they're talking, how they're interacting with each other, what their perspective is of the mission, the unit, the base, all those things, then the commander is not in a position to where they can make those decisions to better affect the morale of the unit. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's move on to the next section that commanders are responsible for promoting and safeguarding, and that's physical well-being. Colin, why don't you, you know, when, when you think physical well-being, what comes to mind immediately? Like, obviously health, the medical side of things, but even more than that, it's just like PT, like physical training. That is a commander's responsibility to make sure that the force, their people, that the unit is physically capable of doing what they need to do. Yep. And you will see this in virtually every single staff meeting you ever attend. You will see the results of any uh, PFAs of the previous week, right? Yeah. We had seven PFAs. Seven for seven passing. Cool. All green. Next slide. Right. Like, yeah, this is a pretty constant thing that you will see. And we went 
into depth on this on our episodes of PT, right? The good, the bad, we know what this looks like, but absolutely, commander's responsibility, you have to make sure your folks are able to do their job and available to do it. But this includes other things too, and, and it comes in later in some other responsibilities. But if you're not able to come to work because of some physical reason, that requires permission. Yeah. Like, you can't just not come to work because you're not feeling good that day. I mean, you're right. Now, that might get delegated down to a supervisor to kind of monitor and control. Yeah, the Air Force does not have, like, a business would a sick leave policy. Like, you have so many sick days that you're allotted throughout the course of a month or a year. And if you go over that, then you're out. Like, you can't take any more sick days. That doesn't exist in the Air Force. So if you are feeling unwell, if you are having a medical issue, then you can take time off. But it absolutely has to be flowed through the right channels for the purpose of accountability. And because the Air Force has a mission to do. And if you're not there, then that means somebody else is going to have to pick up the slack, which means something is not going to get done. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that, like proper chain. You have to go to medical call, sick call, mm -hmm. and you have to have another officer say, yeah, this person can't work. Right. But if the commander doesn't have that note from the med group and you're like, yeah, I'm not feeling well today, they can say tough. Yeah. You got to <laughs> be here. So they've got power there again, you know, kind of going back to that first section about legal power. So usually this is all delegated down. Usually it's managed at a, you know, you contact your supervisor. If you're not feeling well, you let them know what's going on and they'll kind of work out something that will align with the culture that has been established by the commander. Yeah. You know, it's not uncommon for, yeah, just, you know, sore throat, headache and pre COVID life. Let's, let's kind of exclude <laughs> the craziness yeah. that has been COVID. <laughs> but you know, if you just weren't really feeling well that day, it's, generally permissible depending on the culture and where you are okay hey you're not going to come in today if you're still feeling poorly tomorrow go to sick call right yeah that is not uncommon but if something were to happen while you were gone you can better believe that there is going to be some sort of accountability recall or something that says okay where is this person why are they not showing up to work and what is the effect on the mission yeah and that falls with the commander. Yep, absolutely. Another way that you can think about physical well-being is dress and appearance. Okay, yeah. You know, if you are not coming looking like you've got your life together, that's your physical well-being that manifests. And that gets into the next section, and we'll talk about that in a second, general welfare. Well, and interesting to think about that dress and appearance and general hygiene, and those also play back into morale that if people look or smell like a smash bag of donuts, that's going to have an effect on morale. Yeah. And we're bringing that up because it can be and is an issue. I'm, how many times have we heard that someone had to get an LOC because they weren't showering? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, and I think this is a good time to transition to that general welfare section, right? If you're not paying your bills, that's an issue. And your commander's going to get notified. Mm -hmm. Heck, if your spouse gets a ticket on base, mm -hmm. the commander is going to know. Anything that happens to you and yours have the potential to get reported to your commander, especially if there's any potential that it could impact their ability to accomplish the mission. Yeah, We're not going to go into you know too many details about this the general welfare and how commanders can get involved in lives because it tends to stray into that very personal area, you know, where members have got some serious issues going on and the commanders are involved with it. But what I can say is that commanders are going to come across some of the craziest things they've ever experienced in their life. <laughs> Many things they had never even considered to be possibly true, and they certainly weren't trained for. Yeah, but are the realities of what they do day in and day out. And this happens all the time. You know, you'll have a plan. You've got 10 things you got to get done on your list. And you're like, oh, I'm going to have an hour here where I can go make some rounds and go talk to these flight or whatever. And that is all hijacked by a single phone call. Yeah. And you're like, well, <laughs> okay, well, it's going to be another late night. You know, like you see it all the time, but this is what a commander does. Yeah. 
I mean, we'll get into this a little bit more later, especially with the episode on leading people. But it says in section three of AFI One Tech Two that commanders have the unique authority and responsibility to engage in the lives of their subordinates that they must be aware of both on and off duty factors that are affecting the climate and the morale of their units. Yeah. So if a commander is prying into your personal life, that's because they're supposed to. Yeah. And if that's something you aren't interested in doing, you know, if you're just not interested in engaging in that way, maybe you should think about whether or not this is something you want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. So the next section of one tack two goes into the four key areas. And we've gone, Colin, into great detail on these in some different episodes. Yep. And we're actually, over the next two months, going to be rebroadcasting those episodes. But we're going to have some commentary on those concepts from some graduated commanders. Yeah. So that we can understand, because like we said, Colin, we discussed them from the view of an officer's responsibilities, they're going to bring that extra lens of what this means when you're a commander. But I think it's worth kind of briefly talking about each of them just to kind of, you know, re-cage our minds about what these responsibilities are. So I'll start with executing the mission. Obviously, this is why we exist as a service, right? As a force is to execute a mission and making sure that that day-to-day mission happen clearly falls, you know, the commander's responsible. But this also includes being ready to deploy, keeping your people, your equipment, everything ready to go, training, medical, making sure you can do what you've been asked to do. But here's another one that we talked a little bit about, command and control. You got to know where your people are. Yeah. So this includes like leave rosters. You can't just go away for the weekend. Like depending on the rules of where you are, if you wanted to leave the local area, you got to ask. And they got to know where you are. There's like a whole web-based system to track you where you are. Recall rosters being recalled. We had an active shooter incident at my installation a couple weeks ago. Uh, It was not an active shooter, but it was reported to be. And at 1030 at night, I had to recall my entire unit, 100% Mm -hmm. contact. That took a few hours because people go to sleep and phones go into do not disturb mode and all sorts of stuff, right? The commanders were told, I need to know where every single one of your people are right now. Go. Yeah. Like, it's a thing. TDY, PCSs, gains and loss, like keeping track of where your folks are. Accountability is a huge part of executing the mission. Yep. Which leads into the next responsibility directly towards those people. Leading people is obviously a huge part of what commanders do. And in one tack 2, it talks about specific parts of leading that commanders have to be aware of and responsible for the communication of information up and down the chain, making sure that everybody knows what they need to know at the right time and place, the discipline of the unit. Commanders have to cultivate a culture of compliance and accountability and uh, making sure that everybody knows what the requirements are for various different things that they're involved in and providing training on all of those different things. Commanders, like what you were saying for executing the mission, people have to be trained for that. They have to be prepared to carry out the mission. Commanders are also responsible for the development of their people, making sure that every airman has the opportunity to develop not only in rank, but in general skill and ability, and maybe even developing them for the job that comes after the Air Force. Yeah. Commanders are responsible for that too. Yeah. This comes in with this is where that quality of life engagement that you read earlier falls in the document, right? Like you have to engage in the lives of your subordinates to develop them. I mean, what if they're getting out in six months and really want to be, I don't know, underwater basket weaver? I'm being hypothetical, but you get the point, right? Like it's your responsibility, legal responsibility to develop them, to set them up for that. And whoa, it's big. (laughs) It's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, the commander is responsible for the physical, the mental, the social and spiritual resiliency of every person in their unit. And that's no small task. Yeah. Because not only the individual, right, that's in the unit, but individuals are made up of family units. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are lines there. But anyway, it's a big thing. It's a big responsibility. The next section is managing resources. And the first two 
no surprise, people and money, right? Yeah. You've got to manage your manpower. How many times have we talked about people and money being super important? And how many more times are we going to talk about it, especially as we hear from these graduated commanders? I mean, what, <laughs> yeah. what better way for them to really affect the morale and the capability of their unit than by manpower, people, and money? Yep, exactly. And this comes into, you know, the gains, tracking people on the gains and loss roster, making sure that the right people are PCSing at the right time, going where they're supposed to go, and that you get somebody to replace them. Just yesterday, I spent a huge portion of my afternoon learning more in depth about how Talent Marketplace works. Mm -hmm. I've not been a subject of that. I've not moved using that system, so I'm not sure how it works. And so they were going to do some mentorship on Talent Marketplace, and I got to be there. I got to know how yeah. this works <laughs> because there are horror stories about airmen who got PCS to an organization. They're like, this wasn't on my list. This wasn't on my radar. I didn't want this. And turns out that a commander forgot to submit like their plan or something, mm. right? You've heard this. You've heard this, Colin. Yeah. We heard it yesterday in our little training session. So it's a big deal. If you've got civilians in your organization, maybe it's the decision to hire and fire may lie with the commander. Maybe you have to reallocate or cut mission and move people around. These are huge, huge decisions that impact people. Yeah. And just imagine if you were tasked, hi, your unit's too big, you have to cut 15% of your workforce. Ugh. Yeah, which child do you want to dispense with? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's gut-wrenching. It's really, really hard stuff. And talk about impacting your mission. It's huge. Funds. Oh, my gosh, right? We all knew money was important. If I had any idea how much time I would spend trying to figure out money, ugh, it's finding new money, right? Going out and trying mm -hmm. to get people to pay for things that you know you need. Making sure you're spending at the right rate. So that at the end of the year, you've allocated all your funds, making sure you're tracking it all. You can't do anything without money. And so you have got to understand this. And yeah, managing manpower, funds, equipment, same goes for equipment, right? You're going to sign some 1297s. You're going to check out some stuff and you're going to yeah. be responsible for every single little thing. And so when you do a report of survey to find every single desktop computer that's in your unit and you can't find serial number, blah, 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 blah. I promise you're going to hear about it. Yep. <laughs> right. You've been in those yeah. meetings. Desktop computers feel pretty innocuous, but yeah, this applies to even like the more, I guess, exciting or even lethal things, you know, rounds, grenades, you know, things that maybe are being used by a security forces squadron or a munitions squadron. There has to be perfect accountability for those items. Yeah. And promise it will get people pretty excited when that stuff goes missing. <laughs> I don't know that excited is the right word, but yes. Yeah. The temperature in the room goes up a little bit. How's that? <laughs> yeah. So equipment, facilities, Colin, you've probably worked a whole lot more with this. Yeah. But commanders are very intimately involved in being responsible for and managing their facilities that are assigned to them. Well, it's not just facilities. It's the environment that goes with the facility or around the facility wherein people are trying to execute the mission. Yeah, so that includes like HVAC, landscaping, like all that stuff. Yeah, you know, maintenance, upgrades to the facilities, you know, again, all of this being tied very closely back to money and equipment. Yep, yep, exactly. One thing that's also here, airmen's time. Are people showing up? Are they working on the right things? It's a resource that has to be managed. Yep, exactly. And you will be held accountable. Nothing will ruin a commander's day quite like a manpower survey where they decide that you don't need as many people as you think you do. <laughs> right? Or, hey, it says here you're supposed to be doing this thing and you're not doing that thing at all. That's very bad. You know, you've got to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. The commander is responsible for all of it. Colin, what's the last thing on these four categories? Yeah, and so the commander then, based on all of this information and stuff that they're responsible for, their people, their money, the equipment, facilities, time, all of that, they must identify opportunities to improve those things, to spend money more efficiently, to use people more efficiently, to make sure that the facilities that are not meeting standards are brought up to standards or to exceed them to improve the morale, the environment, the ability to execute the mission more effectively. And this 
looks like a lot of different types of things wherein commanders can make those improvements. They can realign the unit to better execute the actual mission itself, moving this person or that piece of equipment from this place to that, from this responsibility to that one. They can take a look at the whole process for accomplishing a particular task and employ things like CPI, continuous process improvement, to make that better. Commanders are responsible for inspecting the unit and their people. And so there's the commander's inspection programs or you know, the SAPM, you know, self-assessment program managers that help to make sure that things are getting done are being done correctly. And all of this requires data, making sure that commanders have all of the information necessary to make accurate and effective decisions at the right time and place. Yeah, it actually says data-driven decisions. Yeah. You got to be able to stand in front of a whole lot of people and say, this is why. And gut feeling is probably not going to carry the day. <laughs> well, there are obviously going to be times where commanders have to make a decision in a data-constrained environment that they don't have everything they need. But where possible, yeah. commanders have the responsibility to collect the data that will enable a sound decision. Yeah, and it allows for that. It even says that right in the AFI, you know, but you need yeah. to use the information. All right, Colin, so we've gone over a ton of things, but what does this look like? When you find a commander, what do all of these responsibilities and the data, what does this look like? It looks like meetings. And paperwork. <laughs> I mean, we could have done that, you know, the TLDR at the very beginning of the yeah. of the episode. Yeah. Too long, didn't read. Commanders are involved in meetings and paperwork. Yeah. Um, but to be a little more specific, right? There's a lot of closed door discussions with the shirt. Yeah. The senior enlisted leader with supervisors, with flight commanders, with flight chiefs. And that's just at the squadron. Yeah. They're also doing all of these same things at higher echelons at the group and at the wing legal they're on a first name basis with the ja if they're doing yep. a good job right <laughs> they are always talking to ja and this also looks like really regular quick meetings i've heard them called stand-ups i've heard them called sinks but nearly every commander i've ever worked for has had some sort of very regular sometimes twice daily like stand-ups sinks where like they're crucial key players of the command team, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Yeah. They get on the same page. They listen to commander's intent. They make sure that they're all firing on all cylinders and rowing in the same direction. A staff meeting is a big deal. That's a big part of the commander's week, right? To get inputs from the people they've delegated a lot of these responsibilities to. Hey, physical training, you know, unit training, unit manning, all those stuff, those all play a role in what the day-to-day -day looks like. But Colin, you're not kidding. It's paperwork and meetings. Yeah, they're trying to gather this data and get a feel for the pulse of the unit. They're trying to, through these meetings and through all this paperwork, they're trying to get their arms around this massive thing called the squadron so that they can carry out their responsibilities to promote and safeguard morale, to be aware of the needs of members of their unit to take care of their general welfare and physical well-being. Is there any surprise why commanders are so busy and why they're constantly moving around and trying to talk to people and get more information, more data so that they can do their job better? Yeah, it's a lot of early mornings and late nights. Something that we should define a little bit is the paperwork. A lot of the paperwork that commanders are dealing with a lot, OPRs, EPRs, and decorations. Why? Mm -hmm. Because how do you take care of people? We've said this before, Colin, you take care of their records because that is that person to a large degree. If this person's doing well and we need to take care of them so that they can have promotion opportunities, competitive program opportunities, et cetera, they have to have good records. And so yeah. commanders put in a ton of time making sure records are on time, that they're complete, that they're accurate, and that they're well-written. So yeah, commanders are intimately involved in that OPR, EPR status, right? Every staff meeting, they're going to talk about it. Yeah, and that's for taking care of the good airmen. But also, if you've got someone who needs some help getting out of the service, commanders need to have those records well documented so that when they go to JA and say, hey, I want to separate this airman from the Air Force for various reasons, they have all of those things in line, and it makes it a much easier 
easier, simpler process for all people involved to accomplish that. To make those data-driven decisions. Yeah, exactly. It's again, data, information, helping to make those decisions more effective and efficient for the squadron. Yeah. Now we briefly mentioned this a few moments ago. We need to bring in some other key elements of the commander, and that is the command team. Because if at any point you've started to feel slightly overwhelmed by the prospect of being a commander, okay, good. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit deliberate. But also, there is a command team. Yeah. There is no physical way. There are not enough hours in the day for this to all be done entirely and exclusively by one person. And so at a squadron, typical command team structure, the commander is going to have an exec. This is often like a, an NCO, maybe a senior NCO, but almost certainly an NCO. And this person's going to help run their calendar, appointments, phone calls, emails, schedule, general office to-dos, that kind of thing, helping the commander just do the little things, Yeah, which makes a lot of difference. And in turn, that person is going to get a bunch of mentorship, a bunch of time around the commander. They get to be a fly on the wall in these discussions, right? These closed door mm -hmm. meetings. And they get to learn a whole lot more about what leadership looks like and what is going on in the unit, which helps them be better NCOs, better senior NCOs, right? Yeah. So you've also got the senior enlisted leader. It used to be the superintendent, but we've just changed that name. So the senior enlisted leader is the senior enlisted of the unit and is the advisor to the commander on all things enlisted matters. Yeah, typically this is gonna be a chief master sergeant. Yeah, exactly. And they advise the commander. And some of these will often have responsibilities delegated to them, like, hey, you are in charge of making sure the morale club is going well. Yes, it's a commander's right. program, but they've delegated that. And there's some other things that they can delegate with that, but they are really crucial advisor to the commander, right? If they want to, say an airman's not been performing well and it's time to discipline them. One of the first people they're going to turn to, aside from JA, is their SEL to say, what is the appropriate level of punishment for this situation to ensure yeah. that we get it right? And also the first sergeant. Yep. The person that has been assigned to that unit. And this is actually something that I don't know we've talked about. A first sergeant is generally from a career field that is outside of that unit. So if this is an Intel squadron, that first sergeant may have come from a maintenance background. Yep. And they do that on purpose so that that first sergeant is able to focus squarely on the morale and welfare of the unit, whereas the senior enlisted leader is going to be from that career field, from that squadron, and much better able to advise on mission-related type of things. Exactly. Yep. So I'm glad you brought in the shirt, the first sergeant, that, you know, they have a crucial role. Depending on your organization, sometimes you will have a first sergeant for a squadron. Sometimes it'll be, you know, a group level that's the first sergeant for multiple squadrons. It just kind of depends sure. on how things are structured. The next important position, at least in the ops world, is the director of operations. So they're kind of the number two, if you will, to the commander, often an FGO, and they are delegated most of the day-to-day -day operational responsibilities, right? And the commander yeah. is more responsible for the beans, bodies, and bullets side of running the organization, mm -hmm. you know, organize, train, and equip. And the DO is more in charge of execution. But together, they advise each other, right? So yeah. I can't do operations as a DO without people and money. And who's got the big stick for that? The commander, right? And so yeah. in this way, we both advise each other. We work together to get the mission done. But here's something we haven't talked about yet. How does the commander, quote, get things done? Yeah, clearly, the commander doesn't get stuff done by themselves. Yes, there are things that only they can do, but they have this command team that helps to facilitate all of that. But more broadly, they have the whole unit that gets things done. And, you know, if we're talking about like a 400 person squadron, like think maintenance, think civil engineering, security forces, there is no way that the commander is going to be able to sit down and talk with and outline all of these things for every person in the squadron. And so the commander then has to rely instead on what is called commander's intent. Commander's intent is where the commander 
communicates to that command team and that gets filtered down to the rest of the unit. It may be in the form of a commander's call where all hands are present and the commander is communicating the vision, the importance of what it is that they're involved in. But the intent is a way for the commander to provide information and some level of trust to the other members of the unit so that they can then carry out the mission, not necessarily on behalf of the commander, but on behalf of the unit is the better way to say it. Yeah. And we can think of the COVID vaccination requirement as an example of this. The president of the United States is not going around and giving shots in the arm to every member of the Department right. of Defense, right? Okay, that is not how that is happening. Yeah. However, they very, very clearly communicated intent. This is what you will do. Mm -hmm. And then everyone below them understands that intent. If it's well communicated, if it's well crafted, if it's clear and concise, such that any random medical technician at you name it base in middle America, USA, when they have a member walk in and say, I need to get my COVID-19 vaccine. They know exactly what they need to do. Yeah. And oh, by the way, the whole system is set up this way. This idea of intent, right? right? We already talked about the challenges. Can you imagine, Colin, can you imagine a CE squadron commander telling every single airman every day what they needed to do? <laughs> it's absurd. It doesn't even get through the first day. Like, yeah, it, it's not just, possible. It's totally crazy. But yet there are four star generals who are required every day to direct the operations of 100,000 plus people in 27 countries and a bajillion square miles on, you know, yeah. massive portions of the planet. How do they do that with commander's intent? Yeah. So you kind of got to get good at this. Yeah. I think this is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to effectively driving the operations. You've got to clearly communicate what needs to get done. And then, like you said, trust and enable your people to actually do it. Yeah. Therein is the conclusion of not only this episode, but of AFI 1TAC 2, that commanders must apply the tenets of command and control in order to make these things happen. Where is command and control best defined? Where commanders pointed to to learn these things? points right back to the doctrine and not just any doctrine, but like joint pub one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. AFI doctrine volume one. <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> it's literally the beginning and the end. It is the point of all of this is to communicate and execute on commander's intent. Well, Reed, I think that pretty well wraps it up that this is what commanders do is that they provide intent so that they can accomplish all these other things that are outlined in not only this AFI of executing the mission, leading people, managing resources, improving the unit, but every AFI. Yep. All of it. All of it. The whole thing. The Air Force is carried out, is executed, is accomplished by commander's intent. So no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But that's what we're here to do, right? We are here to try and provide you, our audience, with some things to think about, with some tools, with some information, and we hope that you've enjoyed this. We have certainly gained a lot from this. We went through a whole lot of material today and looking forward to bringing the insight from graduated commanders at a variety of levels to you, the audience, as we think about this more in depth over the next few months. Because that is ultimately what is missing from what we can provide. Yeah, 100%. Yes, yeah, so we can provide the information. We can point you to all the AFIs, the doctrine, all the things that govern this. But what you and I lack, Reed, is we are not commanders. Yeah, this is just all, you know, white puffy cloud talk, right? This just all sounds <laughs> nice and it's easy. And all plans sound great until you get hit in the mouth, right? And yep. so I think that's what some of these commanders are going to be able to do for us and the audience is saying, yeah, I was going to do this thing. And then I got my command, my entire command time got taken over by, you know, external forces. And this is how they reacted to it. I think it's going to be really great. Looking forward to bringing these discussions to the audience. Yeah. So stick with us. Make sure you uh, are tuning in every other week. We'll be bringing you these episodes and this commentary from graduated commanders. I'm super excited about it because we're going to be learning from people that 
some we know, some we've never worked with before. And so we're going to get lots of different perspectives that I think is going to be beneficial to you and me and as well as our audience. Awesome. That'll do it. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Commission Ed. Thank you.